Jeff Dan, Fungi and Foraging. The interviews for BBC Radio Kent. All courses on it, and straight away he was confident we'd find something, and sure enough we have. We walked no more than 10, 15 seconds into the woods. Jeff's already picked up something. What do you got? There are these winter shelter rails, which are, they can be very common indeed at this time of the year. Um, people ask me what my favourite mushroom is quite a lot of the time. In a way, these are, because just as everything else has given up for the year. The English name is a penny bun, French name set. Italian name Porcino. It's looking a little bit sorry for itself because something's knocked it over, probably a deer, and it's waterlogged, the paws underneath the waterlogged, but the top of this will still be perfectly good to eat. Um, Distinctive features? Well, it's got a paws instead of gills, a brown cap, so stay away from bright coloured belites. Belite means it's got paws instead of gills. Uh, yeah, penny bug. The sap, and a, and which one? Which Penny is Penny Bun. Don't call Penny Bun. Right. The fr English name. Oh, okay. French name. Sorry, the Penny Bun. And the other one. Don't mind the maggots, they won't do you any harm. Those little holes are made by maggots? Yep. Well, beetle grubs, to be more precise. So this is a shaggy parasol, not to be mixed up with a normal parasol. Hmm. Uh, normal parasol's bigger, shaggy parasols always go in the wood. Normal parasol goes in grassland as well. Uh, this one stains red if you cut it open. Known to give a few people gastric upsets, but delicious. One of my favourites. Um, How long gonna... does it take to stain? Uh, well, I'd have to cut the cat, out, cat open to you, for you to see it staining red. Um, I'm going to leave the other one because there's only two of them here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm the only full-time fungi foraging educator in England. Um, I, I, I do it as a full-time job from the end of August to the beginning of December. I take small groups of people out mainly private bookings on public land um, and I, we just go looking for mushrooms spend three hours and, the, and my customers take the mushroom home and, and, and experiment with them so I just give people a, you know, an introduction into foraging for mushrooms And where did this come from for you? Uh, I did it as a hobby for many years I'll get it further into the, <laughs> into the woods straight away we've stumbled on something and I'll get you to explain as much as you can about it Okay I love um, it Just make sure the first one is sent before we cross the call, I'll right? save getting any photos till we get a bit more natural light yes, if we're going to get any I don't know if we will because it'll be rain Are you filming as well? Are you, you're going you're to film the interview? Yeah, okay, no problem cool. with that. There's yeah, a copyright no, issue. Okay. Absolutely great, yeah. No. Okay, shall I press record? So I'm in the outskirts uh, of, of Ashford, uh, and today's my first experience of foraging. Now, I've come out with a man who more than knows his stuff, Jeff Dan. In fact, he takes uh, groups out to go foraging, in some cases there, for the very first time. He's teaching courses on it, and straight away he was confident we'd find something, and sure enough, we have. We walked no more than 10, 15 seconds into the woods. And Jeff's already picked up something. What do you got? There are these winter chance rails, which are, they can be very common indeed at this time of year. Um, people ask me what my favorite mushroom is quite a lot of the time. In, in a way these are, because just as everything else has given up for the year, these, it's quite often you can find thousands of them. You just see one, you see thousands. It's difficult to spot them at first because they're rather well camouflaged. But yeah, this is an important commercially collected species. Um, the English name is winter chanterelle or trumpet chanterelle. French call it a chanterelle, so it's a bit confusing. There's another mushroom called a girole in French that we call a chanterelle. This is the winter chanterelle or trumpet chanterelle, Craterellus tubeformis. Uh, lovely, delicate flavour. There's not much you can do with it apart from pan fry it, really. Um, well, it's good in a spaghetti bolognese or an omelette. Um, Absolutely delicious and pretty much a beginner level mushroom. There's not much you could get this mixed up with, certainly nothing dangerous. Um, it's got a yellow stem, it's quite um, distinctive and then these wrinkle-like things that aren't quite gills underneath. So the only thing you'd mix it up with maybe is it's got proper gills rather than these strange little vein-like wrinkles. 
Um, you see, a real, a real novice like me would, would look at that and say, it's, it's yellower than the kind of mushrooms I've seen before. The, the, the stalks, if you will, are, are taller and thinner. How do you, I mean? How do you? How does one tell a safe mushroom from a non-safe? You have mushroom? to know what they are. There's no rule of thumb. There's no. Everybody's looking for a, a shortcut, but you have to. You have to just have a, a, a list of species that you're looking for. Start with the common ones. The, the, really difficult to mix up with anything poisonous like this one. Um, and yeah, I mean, the problem is if once you start getting beyond that easy 10 or 15, it quickly becomes more difficult. So yeah, you, you learn the, the, a list of the easy ones and you learn the really deadly ones to avoid. And, and, and yeah, you have to just take it slowly. Really. So how, I mean, th these look quite common looking around at our, at our feet now. I can see a uh, good sort of 10, 15, maybe even more. They're, the they're abundant. They're locally abundant, sometimes locally very abundant. Some woodlands, conifer woodlands like this in southeast England, you can find them like this, not just one little patch like this, but they go over as far as the eye can see. You could walk around for the whole afternoon picking them. Uh, so they're locally abundant. You can't find them everywhere, but where you do find them, they can be very common. Keep an eye on the BBC Radio Camp Facebook page. We'll post some, some photos and videos of what we're finding a bit later on. So you'd be happy eating that? Yeah, this is lovely to eat. This is good to eat. Not so good raw, it's a bit bitter. We need to cook it, but yeah, it's great. Stuff. I feel like a bolognese later now. Uh, more from us. I was always into um, unusual foods, but I've, I've been pushing the boundaries in this particular case. There's, a, there's a, for example, a, a species of mushroom that's only discovered in 2004, but has since become very common and has got some edible, good edible relatives. So um, it's called Agrocybe rivulosa. Uh, I've tried eating that. It seemed pretty good chance that it was good to eat and very small chance of it being poisonous, and it is very tasty. So eating that one's easier than spelling it as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't have a common name yet. I think for some people are calling it a wrinkled field cat. That's a translation of the Latin. But... Great. So we're going to have our uh, well, my first experience of uh, of foraging today. From where we're standing now, how where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Uh, we're just going to walk around in this little bit of woodland here. It's a dense conifer woodland, which is quite good for this point in the mushroom season. It's the temperature slightly warmer than it is in, in more open woodland. So just going to walk around here and see what we can find. And we're fairly sheltered from the from the miserable morning rain here. More from us later in the program. Stick that in the basket. I'm going to chop the paws off. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Um, okay. I think we should go head off. There's two other really good mushrooms in this woodland. One over in that corner, and one over in that corner. Okay. Okay. So this is a, another good end of season mushroom. Uh, it's called a wood bluet. Um, you can get these mixed up with all sorts of other things. They've got a very distinctive smell, which has been described as a bit like frozen orange juice. Yep, I recognise that as frozen orange juice, slightly. Yes. One here in slightly yeah, better yeah. condition. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it's wood called, blue. once again, wood, wood blue. blue. B L E W. That's a, that's a terracotta hedgehog. Yeah. But we're not talking about it now, we're getting to the intended destination. Two terracotta hedgehogs. They're not. They haven't got any prickly bits on. They have. They've got spines instead of gills. Oh, I see. Um, I'd rather stroke one of those than a hedgehog. Here, we will find a ring of hedgehog mushrooms. Much more impressive. Go. Okay, so this is a, a very large ring of hedgehog mushrooms. It's another important commercially collected species. Usually sold under its French name of Pied de Mouton or, or Lamb's Foot. Beginner level mushroom because it's it's got spines instead of gills. If you, you see yeah, under there, you, you mean you can't really go wrong. You can't you? really go wrong with that. It's got spines underneath instead of gills or pores. And there's spines. Only, oh wow, I get it that's now. It's called a hedgehog mushroom. Yeah, so I'm right. just zooming in on the spines which we couldn't see in the dark of the woodland. You can see that why it's called. Is it a porcupine? A hedgehog. <laughs> 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 You ain't nothing but a hedgehog, foraging all the time. You ain't nothing but a hedgehog, foraging all the time. And you ain't no porcupine. <laughs> right, this one is, uh, if you look it up, a lot of people will say it's inedible or toxic, but you'll find no information about its toxins. It's suffered from a bad press because it's got an unfortunate Latin name. Tricholoma saponisium, because supposedly it smells of soap. Uh, but it ended up being called, because Tricholoma had the general common name of Knight, this is now but ended up with the English common name Soapy Knight. Okay. Uh, Soapy Knight indeed. It's perfectly good to eat. I tried it on my fiancé, I, I didn't tell her what it tasted like, and she said, Mmm, that's a really strong taste. Salami, smoky. No mention of soap. 
Tricholoma saponisium. <laughs> In the basket, the shopping basket's full and it didn't cost us a penny. I'll, get, I'll do a three, two, one without saying the one. Okay. That's a countdown, okay? Uh, three, two, Okay, so we've found five or six good species in there. Um, this is a winter chanterelle, which is the first one we found. Um, pretty hard to get that mixed up with anything poisonous. Important commercially collected species. Uh, French call it a chanterelle. This is a hedgehog fungus. Absolutely can't go wrong with that. It's got spines instead of gills. Um, usually sold under the French name Pied de Mouton. Uh, that one hangs around all season. It's a robust mushroom that the maggots don't like. This is the one that comes out right at the end, of uh, wood blew it, so um, and this is the one that Hugh Fernley Whittingstall spent ages looking for and couldn't find, but eventually found it. Quite easy to mix that up with other stuff, but it's got a very distinctive smell of frozen orange juice. And this is not in such good condition, but it's the best of the best. This is a French call it a set, but the Italians call it Porcino, English name is Penny Bun. Uh, absolutely delicious, a bit waterlogged, but we can chop the pores off the bottom of that and the top of that is still good to eat. And this is a, a, a relative, another baleek called a bay baleek that some animals had a go at, but again, um, that's not going to put me off. <laughs> Perfect, I'll pause it there, that's great, thank you very much, lovely. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll throw a question your way in there yeah. before we do the tasting, that way you can... Yeah, no, that'd be good, yeah. Okay. Paul, so I can say, I read, I read... Um, some of Jeff's articles in a local newspaper, yeah. um, and I've, I've, I've had a wonderful, I've had a wonderful free foraging trip this morning by yeah. coming along. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll ask you what intro, what got you into it. What you know, what, what, mm -hmm. what sparked your interest? That'll lead on to that. And then we can do the tasting all together. And that way, when there's three voices talking in the tasting, it won't sound so odd. Yeah, exactly. That's what. Three opinions are better than two. <laughs> Well, people don't realise how many mushrooms there are. There's about six or seven times as many species of fungi in the UK as there are plants. So, I mean, you're, if you go to the right place, you're always likely to find stuff, and quite often you're likely to find stuff you've never seen before. Um, and as for the, the walking around, it, it, treading on mushrooms is part of the problem of this. They're often very well camouflaged, so um, I think John Wright says in his book, never walk backwards when you're foraging. If you're relatively cautious, you follow a few rules. Well, the one basic rule is if you don't know what it is, don't eat it. Uh, the, the, most people who get into trouble, uh, what happens is they found something that looks a bit like something they were looking for and they kind of just, they want to have found what they were looking for so they convince themselves that they have. Uh, so yes, yeah, you've got to be careful, but as long as you do actually know what it is you're eating, then you're fine. I guess there are. It was too wet in 2011, I think it was in 2012, it was just rained all summer and the slug population got out of control. So there were mushrooms growing, but they were being massacred as soon as they came out of the ground. So the, the ideal year for a good mushroom year would be hot summer, so the trees have done well, because a lot of them are symbiotic with the trees. And then the temperature's slowly dropping and a mixture of fine weather and, and you know, rains once a week and a bit of fine weather in between and the temperature just drops. So just a kind of average normal sort of year would, 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 would suit most mushrooms. But uh, as I said, this year we had unusual weather conditions and I've seen some unusual mushrooms, whereas the, a lot of the common species weren't very common. So that's good too. So what uh, what kind of people are you finding are, are, are coming to you for courses and to go out on trips like this? And and is it becoming more popular? It's becoming much more popular, and I'd say my customers fall into two general groups. One lot of foodies, and they're inspired by people like Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. They they want fancy new ingredients that they can't buy anywhere else, and especially if they're free. And the others a lot are sort of Ray Mears inspired bushcraft survivalist people who are much more interested in anything they can eat or do anything useful with and make it into tinder or make a plaster out of it. But so yeah, so there's those two broad groups of people who, who, who are getting into this. Perfect, that's great, that's plenty of extra. Yeah, that's that's really rich. That was, yeah, that was really rich. I bet you went a lot further than you usually do in an interview on some of that about the, oh, the, the, the dry. The,